One day you manage to kill a really hard NPC with a lucky swing, and it drops some incredibly epic item, and you make more money in 10 seconds than you made all week, and you have to keep going back to that spot, looking for a monster like it, thinking it'll happen again. But it's random, right? I'm not sure, he said. Matthew says it is. I sometimes think that the game company deliberately messes up the odds so that when you're just about to quit, you get another jackpot. He shrugged. That's what I'd do, anyway. If it's random, it shouldn't make any difference what you do and where you play. If you flip a coin ten times and it comes up heads ten times in a row, you've got exactly the same chance of it coming up heads an eleventh time than if had come up all tails, or half and half. Matthew says stuff like that all the time. He says that although it may be unlikely that you'll get ten heads in a row, each flip has exactly the same chance. Matthew sounds like he knows his math. He does. You should meet him sometime. He swallowed. If he ever gets out of jail, that is. Oh, we'll have to do something about that. She handled six more calls, running the show for another two hours, breaking for commercials and promising all her listeners the most exciting event of their lifetime if they just hung in. At first, Lou listened attentively, but his head hurt and he was so tired, and eventually he slumped in his seat and dozed, drifting in and out of dreams as he listened to Gia berating the foolish factory girls of South China. He woke to a sprinkle of ice water on his face, gasped and sat up, opening his eyes just in time to see Gia dancing back away from him, laughing, her face glowing with excitement. I love doing this show, she said. You're up next, handsome. He looked at his phone and realized that he'd dozed for an hour more, and that it was well past supper time. His stomach rumbled. Gia had taken off her shoes and socks and unbuttoned the top two buttons on her red blouse. Her hair was down and her makeup was smudged. She looked like she was having the time of her life. Wah, his head throbbed and it tasted like something had used his mouth for a toilet. Come on, she said, and moved close again, snapping his headphones on. It's coming up on 8 p.m. This is when my listenership peaks. They're back from dinner. They're finished gossiping, and they're all sitting on their beds. Tuning in on their computers and phones and radios. And I've been hyping you for hours. Every pretty girl in the Pearl River Delta is waiting to meet you, are you ready? I, I, he suddenly couldn't find his tongue. Yes, he managed. Get your headset on, she called, dashing around to her side of the desk and pouncing on her seat. We're live in 10. 9. 8. He fumbled with his headset, swung the mic down, reached for the water glass and gulped down too much, choked. Tried to keep it in, choked more, spilled water all down his front. Gia laughed aloud, gulping it down as she spoke into her mic. We're back. We're back. We're back, and now sisters. I have the special surprise I've been promising you all night. A knight of the people, a hero of the factory, a killer who has hunted pirates in space and dragons in the hills, a professional gold farmer named... Dash quote. She broke off. What name shall I call you by, hero? Oh, he thought for a second. Tank, he said. It's the kind of player I am, the tank. A tank. She giggled. That's just perfect. Oh, sisters, if only you could see this big, muscled tank I have sitting here in my studio. Let me tell you about Tank. I was watching a little video this afternoon, and like many of you, I found myself watching something amazing, dozens of boys, lined up outside an internet cafe, blinking and pale as newborn mice in the daylight. It seemed that they were a different kind of factory boy, the legendary gold farmers of Shenzhen, and they were demanding a better job, better pay, better conditions, and an end to their vicious, greedy bosses. Does that sound familiar, sisters? The police arrived, the dirty Jingcha, with their helmets and clubs and gas, cowards with their faces hidden and their brutal weapons in hand to fight these boys who only wanted justice. But did the boys flee? No. Did they go back to their jobs and apologize to their bosses? No. The Mouse Army stood its ground, claimed their workplace as their rightful home, the place their work paid for. And what did the Jingcha do? Tell me. Tank, what did they do? Lu looked at her like she was crazy. She made urgent hand gestures at him as the silence stretched. I, that is, they beat us up. They certainly did. Sisters, download this video now. Please. Watch as the Jingcha charge the boys of Shenzhen, breaking their heads, gassing them, clubbing them. And now, focus on one brave lad off to the left, right at the 14.22 mark. Strong chin. 
Wide eyes, a little freckles over his nose, hair in disarray. See him stand his ground through the charge with his comrades by his side. See the Jingcha with his club who comes upon the boy from behind and hits him in the shoulder, knocking him down. See the club come up again and land on the poor boy's head, the blood that flies from the wound. That, sisters, is Tank, the boy sitting across from me, bloodied but unbowed, brave and strong, standing up for the rights of workers. Dash quote. She dissolved into giggles. Lou giggled too, he couldn't help it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Look, he's a very nice boy, and not bad to look at, and the Jingcha laid into his head and shoulder like they were tenderizing a steak, and all he was doing was insisting that he had the right to work like a person and not an animal. And he's not alone. They call it the People's Republic of China, but the people don't get any say in the way it's run. It's all corruption and exploitation. I thought the video was amazing, a real inspiration. And then I saw him, our tank, wandering dazed and bloody through. She broke off. Through a location I will not disclose, so that the Jingcha won't know which video footage they need to review. I saw him and I told him I wanted to introduce him to you, my friends, and then he told me the most amazing story I've heard, and you know I hear a lot of amazing stories here every night. A story about a global movement to improve the lot of workers everywhere, and I hope that's the story he'll tell us tonight. So. Tank, darling, start with your injuries. Could you describe them to our friends out there? And Lou did, and then he found himself going from there into the story of how he came to be a gold farmer, what life was like for him, the stories Matthew had told him about how Boss Wing had forced him and his friends to go back to work in his factory, talking and talking until the water was gone and his mouth was dry, and mercifully, she called for another commercial. He sagged into his chair while she got him some more water. You should see the chat rooms, she said. They're all in love with you. Tank. The way you rescued those girls' belongings in Shilong New Town. You're their hero. There are dozens of them who claim that they were there on that day. That they saw you climbing the fence. Listen to this. His muscles rippled like iron bands as he clambered up the fence like a mighty jungle creature. He snorted water up his sinuses, and Gia gave his bicep a squeeze. You need to work out some more. Jungle creature, your muscles have gone all soft. How do you have message boards? Don't they block them? Oh, that's easy, she said. We just pick a random blog out there on the net, usually one that no one has posted to in a year or two, and we take over the comment board on one of its posts. Once they block it, or the server crashes, we switch to another one. It's easy, and fun. He laughed and shook his head, which set his headache going again. He winced and squeezed his head between his hands. Sheer genius. Now the commercial was ending, and they both sat down quickly in their chairs and swung their mics into place. Lou was getting good at this now, the talk coming to him the way it did when he was chatting with his Gildes. He'd always been the storyteller of the bunch. And the story went on, he told of how the Webleys had come to him and his Gildes in game, had talked to them about the need for solidarity and mutual aid to protect themselves from bosses, from players who hunted gold farmers, from the game company. They want to unite Chinese workers, Jia said. Nodding sagely. No, he surprised himself with his vehemence. Uniting Chinese workers would be useless. With gold farming, the work can just move to Indonesia. Vietnam. Cambodia. India, anywhere workers aren't organized. It's the same with all work now, your job can move in no time at all to anywhere you can build a factory and dock a container ship. There's no such thing as Chinese workers anymore. Just workers. And so the Webleys organize all of us, everywhere. That's a lot of workers, she said. How many have you got? He hung his head. Giandi, he said. We can all see the counter, and we all cheer when it goes up by a few hundred, but we're a long way off. Oh, Tank, she said. Don't be discouraged. Tens of thousands of people. That's fantastic, and I'm sure we can get a few members for you. How can my listeners join up? A, oh, he struggled to remember the procedure for this. You need to get at least 50% of your co-workers to agree to sign up, and then we certify the union for your whole factory. I, yeah. 50%. The big factories have 50.000 workers. How do you do that? He shrugged. I'm not sure, he said. We've been mostly signing up small game factories, there's not many bigger than 200 workers. It has to be possible, though. Trade unions all over the world have organized factories of every size. 
He swallowed, understanding how lame he sounded. Look, this is usually Matthew's side of things. He understands all of it. I'm just the tank, you understand. I stand in the front and soak up all the damage. And you can't talk to Matthew because he's in jail. Ah uh, yes, jail. Tell us about what happened today. So he told them the story of the battle, all those millions of girls out there in the towns of Guangdong, and he found himself dot transported. Taken away back to the cafe, the shouting, the police and the screams, his voice drifting to his ears from a long way off through the remembered shouts in his ears. When he stopped, he snapped back to reality and found Jia staring at him with wet eyes and parted lips. He looked at his phone. It was nearly midnight. He shrugged. Dry-mouthed. I, well, that's it. I suppose. Wow, Jia breathed, and queued up another commercial. Are you okay? My head feels like it's being crushed between two heavy rocks, he said. He shifted his butt in his chair and winced. And my shoulder's on fire. I've really kept you up, she said. We're almost done here. Though, you're a really tough bastard. You know that. He didn't feel tough. Truth be told, he felt pretty terrible about the fact that he'd gotten away while his guildies had all been locked up. Logically he knew that they wouldn't benefit from him being jailed alongside of them, but that was logic, not feelings. Okay, she said. We're back. What a story. Sisters, didn't I tell you I had something special tonight? Alas, it's nearly time to go, we all need some sleep before we go back to work in the morning. Don't we? Just one more thing, what are we going to do about this? Suddenly, she wasn't sleepy and soothing. Her eyes were wide, and she was gripping the edge of her desk tightly. We come here from our villages looking to do an honest job for decent pay so that we can help our families, so that we can live and survive. What do we get? Slimy perverts who screw us on the job and off. Bastard criminals who destroy anyone who challenges their rackets. Cops who beat us and put us in jail if we dare to challenge the status quo. Sisters, it can't go on. Tank here said there's no such thing as a Chinese worker anymore. Just a worker. I hadn't heard of these Webleys of his before tonight, and I don't know if they're any better than your boss or the thief running the network sales ripoff next door, and I don't care. If there are workers around the world organizing for a better deal. I want to be a part of it, and so do you. I'll tell you what's going to happen next. Tank and I are going to find the Webleys and we're going to plan something big. Something huge. I don't know what it will be, but it's going to change things. There's millions of us. Anything we do is big. I have a confession to make. Her voice got quieter. A sin to confess. I do this show because it makes me money. A lot of money. I have to spend a lot to stay ahead of the Zengfu, but there's plenty left over. More than you make. I have to confess. It's been a long time since I was as poor as a factory girl. I'm practically rich. Not boss rich, but rich, you understand. But I'm with you. I didn't start this show to get rich. I started it because I was a factory girl and I cared about my sisters. We've been coming to Guangdong province since Deng Xiaoping changed the rules and made the factories here grow. It's been generations, sisters, and we come, we pour mice from the country, and we are ground up by the factories we slave in. For every yuan we send home, our bosses put a hundred in their pockets. And when we're done, then what? We become one of the old grannies begging by the road. So listen in tomorrow. We're going to find out more about these Webleys, we're going to make a plan, and we're going to bring it to you. In the meantime, don't take any crap off your bosses. Don't let the cops push you or your sisters and brothers around. And be good to each other, we're all on the same side. She clicked her mouse and flipped the lid down on her laptop. Phew, she said. What a night. Is your show like this every night? Not this good. Tank. You certainly improved things. I'm glad I kidnapped you from the train station. I am too, he said. He was so tired. I guess I'll call you tomorrow about the next show. Maybe we could meet in the morning and try to reach the Webleys or find a way to try to call my Guildies and see if they're all still in jail. Call me. Don't be stupid. Tank. I'm not letting you out of my sight. It's okay, he said. I can find somewhere to sleep. When he'd first arrived in Shenzhen, he'd spend a couple nights sleeping in parks. He could do that again. It wasn't so bad, if it didn't rain in the night. Had there been clouds that day? He couldn't remember. You certainly can. Right through that doorway, right there. She pointed to the bedroom. 
He was suddenly wide awake. Oh. I couldn't. Dash quote dot. Shut up and go to bed. You've got a head injury, stupid. And you've just given me hours of great radio show. So you need it and you've earned it. Bed, now. He was too tired to argue. He stumbled a little on the way to bed, and she swept the clothes and toys and handbags from the bed onto the floor just ahead of him. She pulled the sheet over him and kissed him on the forehead as he settled in. Sleep. Tank, she whispered in his ear. He wondered dimly where she would sleep, as she left the room and he heard her typing on her computer again. He fell asleep with the sound of the keys in his ears. He barely woke when she slid under the covers with him, snuggled up to him and began to snore softly in his ear. But he was wide awake an hour later when ten police cars pulled up out front of Hohai's buildings, sirens blaring, and a helicopter spotlight bathed the entire building in light as white as daylight. She went rigid beside him under the covers and then practically levitated out of the bed. Twenty seconds, she barked. Shoes, your phone, anything else you need. We won't come back here. Lou felt obscurely proud of how calm he felt as he stood up and, in an unhurried, calm fashion, picked up his shoes, factory workers' tennis shoes, cheap and ubiquitous, and laced them up, then pulled on his jacket. Then moved efficiently into the living room, where Gia was hosing solvent over all the flat surfaces in the room. The smell was as sharp as his headache, and intensified it. She nodded once at him, and then nodded at another pressure bottle of solvent and said. You do the bathroom and the bedroom. He did, working quickly. He guessed that this would wipe away anything like a fingerprint or a distinctive kind of dirt. He was done in a minute, or maybe, less, and she was at his elbow with a Ziploc baggie full of dust. Vacuumed out of the seas of the Hong Kong Shenzhen train, she said. Skin cells from a good million people. Spread it evenly, please. Quickly now. The dust got up his nose and made him sneeze, and sunk into the creases of his palms, and it was all a little icky, but his head was clear and full of the sirens and the helicopter's thunder. As he scattered the genetic material throughout, he watched Gia popping the drive out of her computer and dropping the slender stick down her cleavage, and that finally broke through his cool. Suddenly, he realized that he'd spent the night sleeping next to this beautiful girl, and he hadn't even kissed her, much less touched those mysterious and intriguing breasts that now warmly embraced an extremely compromising piece of storage media, a sliver of magnetic media that could put them both in jail forever. She looked around and ticked off a mental checklist on her finger. Then she snapped a decisive nod and said. All right. Let's go. She led him out into the corridor, which was brightly lit and empty, leaving him feeling very exposed. She pulled a short pry bar out of her purse and expertly pried open the steel door on a fuse panel by the elevators, revealing neat rows of black plastic breaker switches. She fished in her handbag again and came out with a disposable butane lighter, which she lit, applying the flame to a little twist of white vinyl or shiny paper protruding like a pull tab from an unobtrusive seam in the panel. It sizzled and flashed and a twist of black smoke rose from it and then the paper burned away, the spark disappearing into the panel. A second later, the entire panel face erupted in a shower of sparks, smoke and flame. Gia regarded it with satisfaction as black smoke poured out of the plate. Then all the lights went out and the smoke alarms began to toll, a bone-deep dee-da-dee-da that drowned out the helicopter, the sirens. She clicked a little red LED light to life and it bathed her face in demonic light. She looked very satisfied with herself. It make Lou feel calm. Now what, he said. Now we stroll out with everyone else who running away from the fire alarms. All through the building, doors were opening, bleary families were emerging, and smoke was billowing, black and acrid. They headed for the staircase. Just behind the bound foot granny who they'd met the day before. In the stairwell, they met hundreds, then thousands more refugees from the building, all carrying armloads of precious possessions, babies, elderly family members. At the bottom, the police tried to corral them into an orderly group in front of the building, but there were too many people, too much confusion. In the end, it was simple to slip through the police lines and mingle with the crowd of gawkers from nearby buildings who'd turned out to watch. Hash. This scene is dedicated to Vancouver's multilingual Sophia Books. A diverse and exciting store filled with the best of the strange and exciting pop culture worlds of many lands. 
Sophia was around the corner from my hotel when I went to Van to give a talk at Simon Fraser University, and the Sophia folks emailed me in advance to ask me to drop in and sign their stock while I was in the neighborhood. When I got there, I discovered a treasure trove of never-before-seen works in a dizzying array of languages, from graphic novels to thick academic treatises, presided over by good-natured, even slapstick, staff who so palpably enjoyed their jobs that it spread to every customer who stepped through the door. Sophia Books. 450 West Hastings Street, Vancouver. BC Canada v 6 b one l one plus one 604 684 whether you're a revolutionary, a factory owner, or a little league hockey organizer. There's one factor you can't afford to ignore, the Coe's cost. Ronald Coe's was an American economist who changed everything with a paper he published in 1937 called The Theory of the Firm. Coe's paper argued that the real business of any organization was getting people organized. A religion is a system for organizing people to pray and give money to build churches and pay priests or ministers or rabbis, a shoe factory is a system for organizing people to make shoes. A revolutionary conspiracy is a system for organizing people to overthrow the government. Organizing is a kind of tax on human activity. For every minute you spend doing stuff, you have to spend a few seconds making sure that you're not getting ahead or behind or to one side of the other people you're doing stuff with. The seconds you tithe to an organization is the co's cost, the tax on your work that you pay for the fact that we're human beings and not ants or bees or some other species that manages to all march in unison by sheer instinct. Oh, you can beat the co's cost, just stick to doing projects that you don't need anyone else's help with. Like, um, tying your shoes, nope, not unless you're braiding your own shoelaces. Toasting your own sandwich, not unless you gathered the wood for the fire and the wheat for the bread and the milk for the cheese on your own. The fact is, everything you do is collaborative, somewhere out there, someone else had a hand in it. And part of the cost of what you're doing is spent on making sure that you're coordinating right, that the cheese gets to your fridge and that the electricity hums through its wires. You can't eliminate Co's costs, but you can lower it. There's two ways of doing this. Get better organizational techniques, say. Double-entry bookkeeping, an earth-shattering 13th-century invention that is at the heart of every money-making organization in the world, from churches to corporations to governments, or get better technology. Take going out to the movies. It's Friday night, and you're thinking of seeing a movie, but you don't want to go alone. Imagine that the year was 1950, how would you solve this problem? Well, you'd have to find a newspaper and see what's playing. Then you'd have to call all your friends' houses, no cellular phones, remember, and leave messages for them. Then you'd have to wait for some or all of them to call you back and report on their movie preferences. Then you'd have to call them back in ones and twos and see if you could convince a critical mass of them to see the same movie. Then you'd have to get to the theater and locate each other and hope that the show wasn't sold out. How much does this cost? Well, first. Let's see how much the movie is worth, one way to do that is to look at how much someone would have to pay you to convince you to give up on going to the movies. Another is to raise the price of the tickets steadily until you decide not to see a movie after all. Once you have that number, you can calculate your co's cost, you could ask how much it would cost you to pay someone else to make the arrangements for you, or how much you could earn at an after-school job if you weren't playing phone tag with your friends. You end up with an equation that looks like this. Value of the movie. Cost of getting your friends together to see it equals net value of an evening out. That's why you'll do something less fun, stay in and watch TV, but simple, rather than going out and doing something more fun but more complicated. It's not that movies aren't fun, but if it's too much of a pain in the ass to get your friends out to see them, then the number of movies you go to see goes way down. Now think of an evening out at the movies these days. It's 6.45 p.m. on a Friday night and the movies are going to all start in the next 20 to 50 minutes. You pull out your phone and Google the listings, sorted by proximity to you. Then you send out a broadcast text message to your friends, if your phone's very smart, you can send it to just those friends who are in the neighborhood, listing the movies and the films. They reply all to one another. And after a couple volleys. You've found a bunch of people to see a flick with. You buy your tickets on the phone. But then you get there and discover that the crowds are so huge you can't find each other. So you call one another and arrange to meet by the snack bar and moments later. 
You're in your seats, eating popcorn. So what? Why should anyone care how much it costs to get stuff done? Because the cos cost is the price of being superhuman. Back in the old days, the very, very old days, your ancestors were solitary monkeys. They worked in singles or couples to do everything a monkey needed, from gathering food to taking care of kids to watching for predators to building nests. This had its limitations, if you're babysitting the kids, you can't gather food. If you're gathering food, you might miss the tiger, and lose the kids. Enter the tribe, a group of monkeys that work together, dividing up the labor. Now they're not just solitary monkeys. They're groups of monkeys, and they can do more than a single monkey could do. They have transcended monkeyness. They are super monkeys. Being a super monkey isn't easy. If you're an individual super monkey, there are two ways to prosper. You can play along with all your monkey pals to get the kids fed and keep an eye out for tigers, or you can hide in the bushes and nap, pretending to work, only showing up at mealtimes. From an individual perspective, it makes sense to be the lazy jerk monkey. In a big tribe of monkeys, one or two goof offs aren't going to bankrupt the group. If you can get away with napping instead of working, and still get fed, why not do it? But if everyone does it, so much for super monkeys. Now no one's getting the fruit. No one's taking care of the kids, and damn. I thought you were looking out for the tigers. Too many lazy monkeys plus tigers equals lunch. So monkeys, and their hairless descendants like you, need some specialized hardware to detect cheaters and punish them before the idea catches on and the tigers show up. That specialized hardware is a layer of tissue wrapped around the top of your brain called the neocortex, the new bark. The neocortex is in charge of keeping track of the monkeys. It's the part of your brain that organizes people, checks in on them, falls in love with them, establishes enmity with them. It's the part of your brain that gets thoroughly lit up when you play with Facebook or other social networking sites, and it's the part of your brain that houses the local copies of the people in your life. It's where the voice of your mother telling you to brush your teeth emanates from. The neocortex is the cos cost as applied to the brain. Every sip of air you breathe, every calorie you ingest, every lubdub of your heart goes to feed this new bark that keeps track of the other people in your group and what they're doing, whether they're in line or off the reservation. The cos cost is the limit of your ability to be superhuman. If the cos cost of some activity is lower than the value that you'd get out of it, you can get some friends together and do it. Transcend the limitations that nature has set on lone hairless monkeys and become a superhuman. So it follows that high cos costs make you less powerful and low cos costs make you more powerful. What's more, big institutions with a lot of money and power can overcome high cos costs, a government can put 10.000 soldiers onto the battlefield with tanks and food and medics, you and your buddies cannot. So high cos costs can limit your ability to be superhuman while leaving the rich and powerful in possession of superpowers that you could never attain. And that's the real reason the powerful fear open systems and networks. If anyone can set up a free voice call to anyone else in the world, using the net, then we can all communicate with the same ease that standard for the high and mighty. If anyone can create and sell virtual wealth in a game, then we're all in the same economic shoes as the multinational megacore that start the games. And if any worker, anywhere, can communicate with any other worker, anywhere, for free, instantaneously, without her boss's permission, then, brother, look out, because the cos cost of demanding better pay, better working conditions and a slice of the pie just got a lot cheaper. And the people who have the power aren't going to sit still and let a bunch of grunts take it away from them. Hash. This scene is dedicated to the MIT Press Bookshop, a store I've visited on every single trip to Boston over the past 10 years. MIT, of course, is one of the legendary origin nodes for global nerd culture, and the campus bookstore lives up to the incredible expectations I had when I first set foot in it. In addition to the wonderful titles published by the MIT Press, the bookshop is a tour through the most exciting high-tech publications in the world, from hacker zines like 2600 to fat academic anthologies on video game design.